Greetings, fellow Bible readers. Welcome to week 43 of our Bible read-through. This week, we're going to handle the bulk of Mark's Gospel, and then we're going to head on into the Gospel of Luke. With the, the portion of Mark's Gospel that we're dealing with, a significant thought that you'll want to keep in mind, and we'll see it across all the readings for the week, are that we're going to be moving towards the cross. You're going to see references to Jesus' suffering and death as we move through our chapters this week in Mark. And then when we get into Luke's Gospel, you really want to pay attention to uh, the introduction that Luke writes. And one of the key thoughts there is that Luke is writing this for a guy named Theophilus in order that Theophilus can have certainty about the life of Jesus, what he came to do and say and preach. And so that idea of certainty is a key thing. That also is one of the reasons why there are more than one gospel account of Jesus' life, uh, that there to be certain about this life of Jesus, we get not one, not two, not three, but four gospel accounts of Jesus' life so that we've got four different witnesses that all verify who this Jesus was, what he taught, so that we can be certain about it. Because the Bible in some things, especially stuff kind of important like salvation, it gives us a lot of, of backup information, a lot of proof for it, uh, at least according to the way that we kind of look at evidentiary proof, like in a courtroom where you'd expect multiple witnesses in order to establish the truth. So we get that in, in scripture here. So let's dive into the readings for each day. Day one, we take a look at Mark chapters 7 through 9. Chapter 7, we get a, a lengthy and detailed uh, presentation by Jesus himself of where the real split between him and the Pharisees came down. And it came down in the fact that the Pharisees rejected God's word and instead created their own word and their own law in order to be able to somehow try to please God. And so they created this work righteousness by following their own ideas rather than listening to God's word where the main message is salvation through the Savior God was going to send. And that's the decisive break that really pits Jesus against the Pharisees throughout all of, of Jesus' ministry. So here it's really encapsulated in one chapter very nicely. And then starting in chapter 8, we get that shift in emphasis of now we're heading towards the cross. Day 2, we look at chapters 10 and 11. And as you look at these two chapters, you'll want to pay attention to the sins that Jesus uh, deals with in, in these two chapters and how he deals with them, how he fixes these sins and addresses them. Then on day three, we get chapters 12 and 13. It's very interesting here is the conversation Jesus has with that expert in the law. And at the end, Jesus says, hey, you're not too far from the kingdom of God. And that really highlights that knowledge of the law is a useful thing. Um, it does benefit you and get you closer to God's kingdom, but it's also significant to note it doesn't actually get you into God's kingdom. That's because the law can drive you to realize your need for a savior, can drive you to despair, the point where you are ready to turn to Christ Jesus for rescue. But without the gospel, you don't have the kingdom of God. So important point there. Day four, we get chapters 14 and 15 of Mark's gospel. What's very striking here is the silence of Jesus. If you have one of those red letter Bibles where all of Jesus' words are in red, you'll notice when you get to chapters 14 and 15 that the red part, Jesus speaking, it just shrinks down till it's almost nothing. That's because Jesus has gotten to the point in his ministry where he is no longer going to preach about what he's going to do. He's simply going to do it. He's going to, to carry out the, the mission that he came to fulfill. On day five, we get Mark chapter 16 and Luke chapter 1. We already mentioned Luke chapter 1 with the introduction, and then we get some stuff that sets up Jesus' ministry. I do want to spend a minute, though, with Mark chapter 16. It's a rather significant chapter, first and foremost, because it's an account of Jesus' resurrection. And it's a very personal and powerful account with the way that God sent, G sent angels to tell the women a message specifically for Peter, assuring him that he was still one of Jesus' disciples, that he was forgiven, that everything Jesus did was for him. Very, very powerful message. The other thing that's significant about Mark chapter 16 is the last last 12 verses, verses 9 through 20. The reason why they're significant is because in, in almost any translation you read, uh, you're going to probably notice a note in your translation that tells you that there's maybe some question about whether these 12 verses belong in the Bible, that some of the earliest uh, and most reliable manuscripts don't have them. And that's true, that there are two very early Greek manuscripts that don't have these verses in them. There's also a lot of other Greek manuscripts that are very early that do have them. So there's a lot of evidence in both directions. So Christians 
um, in the last couple of centuries especially, as, as this information has kind of become more widely known, have really started to debate and discuss this. And sometimes people will say, well, no, these verses don't belong at the end of Mark's Gospel because they're not in those early manuscripts. They've got some very different vocabulary and a different style, so it doesn't seem like Mark wrote them. Other people say, well, we do have early manuscripts that have them in them, and the, the content is different, so of course the wording and vocabulary is going to be a little different. I think ultimately, sometimes the the controversy over these 12 verses gets a little bit overblown. It's kind of like, a, I would say, maybe almost a tempest in a teapot. I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing things too much, but you just stop and think about it. For us Christians, the main thing is that we have God's word, because that's what God has promised to give us. He's promised to preserve his word forever, that not even the least stroke of the pen is going to disappear. If those 12 verses are part of the Bible, well, they're there. They haven't disappeared, so we don't have to worry about that, oh no, God didn't keep his word to preserve uh, the Bible. If they aren't part of the Bible, well, okay, that's kind of a little bit unfortunate that something has kind of come in that shouldn't. Um, however, you look at those verses and there's nothing in them that's going to lead you away from Jesus, that's going to contradict anything else that we find in the Bible. Everything in it completely agrees with what we find in the rest of God's word, and so there's no... Um, danger that they're going to somehow take you away from the faith. So it's not really something you need to concern to be too concerned about. Um, but if you are concerned, it's a good thing to just talk about your pastor about. So let's move on now to day five or to day six. We get into Luke chapters two and three. And in these two chapters, one of the big things you want to notice is how Luke emphasizes people and places. If you are going to write history, even if you're just going to write a news article and you wanted to write a news article about the life of Jesus, you'd want to answer questions like who, when, right? What's going on? That kind of stuff. And that's exactly what Luke does. He presents a very orderly, detailed account, gives us those who and where questions, answers to those who and where questions. Then on day seven, we get into chapters four, five, and six of Luke's gospel. What's really interesting here is in chapter six of Luke's gospel, we get some content that's almost identical to some stuff we saw back in Matthew chapter chapters five and seven in the Sermon on the Mount. However, in Luke's gospel in chapter six, we're told that this happened on a level place. And critics of the Bible will look at that and say, ah, see the Bible, it doesn't know what it's talking about. It can't even, can't even be consistent about Jesus and where he preached. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You stop and think about it. If you're a teacher and you've got something important you wanna say, and you've got lots of different people that are coming to you at different times, you're probably gonna repeat the same material a couple of times. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. One time he gives a sermon on a mountain. Another time he recycles a lot of the same material, does it on a plane, and Matthew records the one, Luke records the other. Absolutely no contradiction, no difficulty at all. That's all we've got for this week. We'll see you next week.